snugly into the payload bay of the space shuttle. If you went to Hubble when it was bolted in the payload bay and tried to put your fist between the telescope and the side of the shuttle, there was not a whole lot more room than your fist. That's how tightly squeezed into the bay it was. And one of the really remarkable things to me about Hubble as I dug into the history is sort of hinted at in the sketch on the right. That's an exploded diagram that shows you all of the equipment bays, all the little doors are open that give you access to the scientific instruments, these big boxes on the bottom, and to the, the operating electronics that sit here in the middle. All of the stuff that makes Hubble work, that makes electricity, that routes it around, that runs the data, that processes the, the onboard um, observations, the science instruments, the cameras and the spectrometers, the architecture that Hubble was given, again, back in the late 60s, early 70s, back in the infancy of the space age, Hubble's engineers had the foresight, drawn largely from their experience on cars, to think about how to make, give Hubble an architecture that would let space-suited astronauts work on it hundreds of miles above the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. Space-suited astronaut, what does that mean? Imagine putting on two full-body snowmobile suits, bolting a bucket on your head, uh, hefty gloves under mittens, and then go change spark plugs in your car. <laughs> By the way, if you put a tool down, it'll float away from you. So it's, it's an incredibly difficult working environment to be doing things like you know, taking out fine screws. So you, so you really have to think about how do, how do I make a wrench that someone with that big klutzy hand can actually hold on to. This stuff is not found on aisle four at Home Depot. Uh, a few things are found on aisle four that you can modify for this. You can go get a ratchet wrench off aisle four and modify it so it has a fat enough handle that a spacesuit glove can hold it, uh, and a big mushroom at the, uh, at the pivot point of it so that you don't have to make a fine grip. That's very hard to, you can't close your hand this tight in the spacesuit glove. But a lot of other stuff just doesn't exist in the universe that needed to be invented. The, the choreography of getting all this repair work done also had to be invented. And that we worked out largely underwater. You see two different water tanks here and two different simulation sessions. This water tank is not deep enough to let the whole telescope stand up altogether. So we would break the model and have the back end over here as if it was mounted in the shuttle and the front end of it off to the side. That's me on the left. Here, uh, uh, that's me again uh, moving around a mock-up, a rough model of one of the scientific instruments. So for this kind of choreographing of a spacewalk, you want this box to be as close as exact, the right set, um, the right dimension, the right shape, the right size, but you don't want to have to move a real box through the water. You know, think about how hard it is just to put, pull your hand through the water. So if you look carefully, you'll notice you can see through this box. There's just a mesh on it, like screen door mesh, to give you a sense of the shape, remind you you won't be able to see around this thing. So learn, can I, can I hold it? Do I have a place to grab? Can I see around it? Do I need a partner helping me spot where it's at if I'm trying to precisely insert it back into its slot? That choreography took dozens and dozens uh, of long tests like this with Bruce and me and a dozen other astronauts. We wanted to be sure that more than just the two of us had good familiarity with the telescope so that we had a, a good bench strength on being able to work on Hubble. And then here's another discovery I made uh, working on the book. Uh, I thought, because of what my boss said to me, I thought it had always been the plan that anything that would need to be repaired on Hubble would be done by spacewalking astronauts. And I learned as I was researching this book that that was not true. The original idea was these big boxes, the big scientific instruments and the batteries, a short list of things that were, you, know, you knew you wanted to keep abreast of technology or you knew they would tend to fail earlier. That short list of things was designed for spacewalking astronauts to work on. All the other electronics were never done with that in mind at all. Because the first idea was we'll bring it back to Earth every five years or so. So we'll, do, oh, yeah. we'll design these jobs to be sort of easy, definitely doable in a spacesuit. The other stuff, the really hard stuff, we'll just bring it home. We'll let folks in shirt sleeves in a specialized maintenance facility do it. 
That idea did not die until late 1984. And when it died, the engineers looked at the whole list of other electronics boxes and realized, holy cow, that stuff can fail too. We actually have to find a way to modify that stuff. The telescope is built and exists. You can't take it apart and redo bits. Somehow we have to make those pieces maintainable in space as well. And so that drove another wave of innovation. First thing you have to deal with if you're going to go repair something in orbit is how do I hold my feet still? It's easy here. I've got gravity. I'm held down to the stage. I can, I can move this podium because of the gravity creating the friction between my feet and the stage. You don't have that in outer space. You need one of these. It's called a portable foot restraint. You slip your toes through here. You slip the back of your heel through here. And as you might infer, if you touch your toe to this little pedal, you can pitch forward and back. If you touch this pedal, you can pivot left to right and all these other little places here. You can, you can tweak this thing around so that it can stick you to be just where you need to be to do some work. This did not exist when we started on Hubble. We had to create it through some of that iterative choreography of the water tank and then clever engineers figuring out what happens inside this gizmo here that makes it possible for this little pedal to tilt and pivot the foot restraint. It works brilliantly. It's still in use on the International Space Station. But we had a particular problem for the flight we were going to do in 1990. This thing, when it all got said and done, came in at 35 pounds. It's a chunk. And it's a, almost three feet from over here where it would plug into the telescope out to here. What's the problem with that? If Bruce or I had to go outside and fix the telescope on the deployment mission, the robotic arm that we sometimes use like a cherry picker to move an astronaut around it would be busy. It was holding the telescope above our heads. So we were going to have to move hand over hand, like we were moving across a jungle gym. We would have to move hand over hand up to whatever point on the telescope we needed to work on and somehow drag this thing along with us. Tether it. Just tether it, you would say. Sure. And every time I move my body, this 35-pound blivet goes drifting around and bangs into the telescope. The skin of the telescope is thinner than a beer can. A 35 pound widget banging around like that is yes. a sure way to end your career by destroying the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> <laughs> so we realized well, we, need, you know, we need a tether. We have to attach it to ourselves. I have to get it out sort of behind me because I need all this space here to use my hands to maneuver. But I need a tether that's, that's stiff, that's kind of rigid. Uh, but that I can also make bendable so I can get this thing off. And we created a gadget called the semi-rigid tether. Anybody ever work with those monkey tripods for your camera or your GoPro that you can bend around? That sort of principle, but larger. We created one to use with this foot restraint. And like the foot restraint itself, it's still in use. So the scene you're seeing here uh, it's from the opening moments of the spacewalk that Christina Cook and Jessica Meir did just a couple of weeks ago. And I'm going to draw your attention to, this is Jessica here, and I'm going to draw your attention to this right here. She also had to transport this repair, this new unit, and also needed it to stay out of her way but be controllable. And this bit connecting the package to her is that same semi-rigid tether still in use on the International Space Station today. Mm -hmm. Those boxes that suddenly we realized we would have to be able to work on, they were uh, a problem in their own right. You can see that the electrical connectors, no one, no one put those on that box thinking a fat spacesuit hand would ever have to get at them. They're imagining some nice slender nimble finger from a ground technician. Uh, and so this is an odd set of pliers that actually has jaws that go this way so that you can reach down around these connectors and undo them uh, without damaging the cable or the box that they're attached to. And here you see me and this is Bruce McCandless with one of our um, British engineers. This is that crazy modified ratchet wrench that we had to create. We're testing it on the actual telescope, on the actual solar array. And this is actually the solar array that jammed on the day that we were deploying Hubble and that I almost ended up, I was in the airlock, I was in my spacesuit half of the air was dumped out of the airlock. 
uh, I was going to have to go out and actually crank the solar array open, except that sadly some snarky software engineer on the ground figured out a way to solve that without letting us go outside. <laughs> I was, you no, know, I was conflicted. I sort of was really ready for this and knew I could, you know, you know, you know your stuff, but suddenly the life of the Hubble Space Telescope is in your hands before it ever starts. No pressure. Uh, on the other hand, it is a spacewalk, so you, that's kind of a little great tension. So we come finally to where uh, Hubble is in the payload bay. We are all trained up. Uh, we've created the entire toolkit. We've taken every single tool, every single one of over 100 tools we've taken out to Hubble. We've proven by checking that it fits on every fitting, that it works in all the settings it needs to work on. There's no way anyone's ever going to get to Hubble on a repair mission and have to call home and say, oops, guys, the wrench doesn't fit. That is never going to happen. We have that nailed. And we go down, go down to the Cape for our countdown dress rehearsal. Always happens in the shuttle world about three weeks before liftoff. This was the emblem we had created to signify our mission. And a tradition is that you get a batch of really nicely done enamel, uh, full color tie tacks made with the crew emblem. And the crew members go around and visit all the engineers who have spent months getting the space shuttle, shuttle and its cargo ready for the next flight. And you take pockets full of these with you. And you thank these folks. They have been working just as long as you have. They've been working with just the same skill and professionalism as you've been bringing to the work. They don't get the flight suit. They don't get the ride. They don't get the view. They don't get any of the cool things that come with being an astronaut but they're doing just as fine a job with just as much commitment. And so we got bags. We got the better part of a thousand lovely pins to give to guys. And someone had the good idea of putting a little extra bar down here that would say launch team so they could wear it with great pride and point out that the crew gave me this, I'm on the launch team. There was just one small problem. <laughs> These are now the most coveted collector items at the Kennedy Space Center. They attempted a recall. You guys give those back. Not a chance. How do you do spell check on a lapel pin, right? And, you know, and it is spelled correctly. It's just the wrong word, right? Yeah. Autocorrect fails again. <laughs> so here we are on April 24th, 1990. Uh, April 20, this is April 24th, April 23rd, we had launched. So this is the day after we launched. We're on orbit. We've, uh, Steve Hawley, and with Charlie Bolden's help, has lifted Hubble up out of the payload bay, held it over our heads while the team on the ground commanded these antennas to unfold and these solar rays to unfurl. Uh, this is the one I almost had to go crank out. Um, and look, look at this little gap right here. Really cool picture, right? Let me remind you what's happening here. All this stuff down here, and this little soda straw that comes up like that, that's a 200,000 pound, multi-billion dollar craft called a space shuttle. And is currently doing 17,500 miles an hour. And this thing here is a 55,000 pound, multi-billion dollar telescope. And it is doing 17,500 miles an hour. So you have two multi-billion dollar spacecraft at this moment flying 10 inches apart in very, very close formation. And a moment after this picture was taken, Lauren Shriver, our commander, would fire the engines on the shuttle and back the space shuttle away from the telescope and let it go off to do its remarkable mission. And Kathy Sullivan and Bruce McCandless, who only worked for five years on the telescope getting to this day, you would imagine we're up here gazing out and taking pictures. No. We're locked in something roughly the size of two linen closets, right behind that little round circle there. Uh, as I said, we were in the airlock. We were in our suits. They were pressurized. We dumped half of the air out of the airlock, so we now we can't go out or in without a whole next series of steps. So we're kind of trapped in the airlock. And Hubble's batteries are draining. So it quickly became more important to get Hubble off on its own and get the solar rays charging the battery than to get Kathy and Bruce out of the airlock so that they could watch the deployment. 
Uh, we understood that, but you know, you're kind of five years. Guys, we don't get to watch this. <laughs> so what happened? What happened next? Our high hopes for a spectacular first image from Hubble came crashing to Earth a few weeks later when the world learned that the multi-billion dollar space telescope we had just put into orbit had blurry vision. Charlie and Steve spent many long weeks worrying that they might have caused this by bumping the telescope as they lifted it gingerly out of the shuttle's cargo bay. They must have been the only two people on Earth who were relieved to learn that Hubble's 94-inch diameter primary mirror was the wrong shape. <laughs> it was too flat at the perimeter by .0001 inch, which is about 1 50th, 5 zero, 1 50th the diameter of a human hair, or 1 40th the thickness of a typical hardcover book page. This was unbelievable news, an unthinkable error. A tidal wave of shock and anguish swept over NASA and the Hubble science community. Congress and the media erupted in outrage. It was as if an eagle had turned into a bat, wrote Arthur Fisher in the October issue of Popular Science. The pain was clearly written on the ashen faces of the NASA officials who broke the news to the public. The crippled telescope quickly became the newest metaphor for incompetence and technological hubris ridiculed in print by virtually every late night talk show and on the silver screen. Some pundits linked the Hubble fallop to the mistakes that caused the loss of Challenger and cast it as the death knell for a NASA that had long since lost its way. Congress followed hot on the heels of the comedians and pundits, convening public hearings at which they grilled senior NASA leaders mercilessly. Well, as you all know, because this really becomes the part of the Hubble story that is more familiar, um, the Hubble team pulled itself together uh, and discovered one really helpful fact and then had a clever idea. The helpful fact was you did screw up, but you screwed up very precisely. <laughs> Which meant just like your eye doctor can precisely calculate what optical formula will make your eyes see more clearly, it was possible to calculate very precisely what adjustment would restore full high sight to Hubble. The clever idea was, well, that's really cool. Now I know what optics I need, but how do I get those into the light path of a telescope that's already in orbit? And the inspiration for that, believe it or not, came from a shower in Holland. A Lockheed engineer named Jim Crocker has got his head whirling about all these problems and issues and trying to come up with some way to cleverly get these mirrors, small corrective mirrors, into the telescope. Goes into the shower one morning at his hotel room in Holland in Utrecht, and he's a really tall guy, so he loosens the shower head and moves it up the pole to a nice height and then adjusts its tilt. And it dawns on him that a mechanism that could extend up out of one of the science instruments with small arms that would spring out and put these mirrors in just the right place could be exactly the way to get the corrective optics into Hubble. And that became a device called COSTAR, the corrective optical device that was, oops, there we go. Press the right button, Kathy. There you go. 